the new director for the Walter H. Kapp Center for the Study of uh, Ethics, Religion, and Public Life at University of California, Santa Barbara, and delighted to be there, or at least be there in principle. Um, my family and I are in the midst of a transition that was supposed to be taking place now. Um, we're all in the midst of turmoil in various ways, and we get to throw in uh, the variables of a move on top of that. Um, the CAP Center, our mandate to deal with questions of ethics and public life um, sometimes seems like an abstract exercise, but with the moment we're collectively facing, it's become uh, so real and in ways that are going to challenge us for days, months, years to come. And so at the CAP Center, we're really thinking hard about how can we matter at this moment? How can we open up conversations, classroom experiences, and so forth? And in the near-term horizon, um, in thinking about who might speak with us about what we're facing, who can bring scientific expertise, medical expertise, and also um, street-level social engagement in various places with these issues, and uh, my good friend, Dr. Daniel Griffin, came to mind. And I'll give him a proper introduction in a moment. But I'm just so delighted that he could join us for this conversation um, in the CAPS spirit. Um, now, I want to say a word about the flow of the event tonight. What we'll do is Dr. Griffin, after these introductions, will present um, a fairly brief slideshow, talk us through some issues. Then we're going to shift gears to a conversational mode where uh, Dr. Pukowski and I uh, engage Dr. Griffin in, with some questions ranging from the scientific and the medical to how do we move forward as communities, best practices, how do we cope with fears, so forth. Then uh, we invite you participants to engage us through the Q&A function that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. You just type in your questions and uh, we'll have some help uh, doing triage on the questions and make sure we get to as many of them as possible. Fair enough? Okay, good. Um, first, some thank yous uh, to the staff at the Walter H. Capp Center. Uh, the Associate Director, Maeve DeVoy, has done a great job helping bring things together in an online environment. And the student workers, and in particular, Alma Mendoza, has been um, a star getting things together for us. So thank you both. Also, the donors, uh, who make these things possible. Thank you. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our co-moderator, Dr. Jason Protowski. Uh, he is incredibly diverse. I just can't wait to hear the conversation between these guys. Uh, MD and MPH from Northwestern University. His BA from UCSB, a pretty good school we hear. All right, Jason. And now heading up, as I mentioned, the Medical Humanities Initiative for us and looking forward to partnering with you, Jason, on many more things. Also an emergency room physician at the Santa Barbara and Santa Inez hospitals. And at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital is the Ethics Committee co-chair. And at the Santa Barbara Fire Department, the medical director, which eager to hear more about what that involves. And in Santa Barbara is on the board of directors of Doctors Without Walls. And he has a follow-up, an event almost immediately following this. And hopefully he'll link the information in the chat room or later when we're talking, maybe you can screen share. But it's about an update on COVID in Santa Barbara and how the medical community is addressing it. Is that a fair? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's at six o'clock Pacific time. Um, Dr. Daniel Griffin, our guest for tonight, uh, MD, PhD, the MD from New York University, PhD in molecular medicine from the Feinstein Institute. He's the chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at Pro Healthcare. He's the head of infectious disease research at United Health uh, Group. He's an instructor at Columbia University's Irving Medical Center. He's an associate research scientist at Columbia's uh, Department of Biochemical and Molecular Biophysics. And he's the president and director of Parasites Without Borders. And they have a really amazing blog and webcast that I urge you to check out. Hopefully he'll say more. And he's a regular on something called This Week in Virology, something that wasn't <laughs> on all of our radar 
uh, collective radar until recently, and he's been a talking head on CNN, among other news outlets of late. Uh, most of all for me, he's my college housemate, an adventure partner of many decades, and a dear, dear friend who's allowing us to call on his time when it's most precious. So uh, welcome, Dr. Griffin. And thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So let's just turn it over to you. And then when you're done with uh, your presentation, Jason and I will jump in to round out the conversation and see where we take this. Okay, now I'm gonna try to do a share my screen and put up some slides here. So uh, hopefully you guys will give me uh, the, per the screen sharing permission. Click on this a few times, looks like it's gonna happen. Um, all right, okay. All right. So let's see. Does, does that work for people? Can people see that well? I can. Okay, excellent. All right. So let's go through this. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction. And I'm uh, going to be uh, doing a presentation, COVID-19, the health crisis and community. So I want to start off with a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm not going to tell you everything. Um, I have the ability to share my experience and knowledge. Um, and as I'll, I'll describe, it's um, been quite a bit, actually. Um, Dan, I'm going to interrupt for just one yeah. second. I forgot an important disclaimer myself. Oh, this, go for it. This is being uh, videotaped, and uh, particularly for the Q&A folks uh, who might be unaware of that, I wanted you to know that you can ask your questions anonymously through that function, but this is being uh, taped through the Zoom function. Okay. All Thanks. right. <laughs> All good. I'll be careful what I say now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the next thing is, um, you know, I can give you the tools to understand the challenges you're going to face. Um, but really, the big thing is um, you, you're going to have a lot um, going forward, you know, working together as communities um, to really try to come up with solutions. So, so let me start by sharing a bit of, um, you know, what, what I can share about SARS-CoV-2, um, what everyone now is referring to as COVID-19, the disease COVID-19 caused by this SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, you know, we initially heard about these um, first cases in China in December of 2019. Um, it was in January of 2020 that the, uh, the first case in uh, Washington State was announced in a traveler. Um, and initially, there was a suggestion that, oh, you had to go to one of these horrific <laughs> wet markets in China to, to worry about it. Um, but then it became apparent that it was actually person-to-person -person spread. Um, and now as we learn more, we're beginning to see that it probably was spreading even before we heard about it in December 2019. Um, just to give you a sense of where this was in China, where the virus came out of, there's Wuhan and it's sitting inland, so you, you think you don't have to worry about it, but this is a huge transportation hub. And because of that being a huge transportation hub, um, that coupled with the Chinese New Year, the timing of that led for, um, well, what we're experiencing now. Um, so here, let me outline a little bit how we're gonna go through this. And this is gonna be brief, because I, I think the, the dialogue is gonna be the most helpful for everyone. But I wanna describe for you what we've learned and what I've seen firsthand as far as clinical presentation and complications, and gonna address this really important issue, are the young really spared? I think that um, is an issue. Then I want to explain a little bit about testing approaches. How do we, how do we look at that? Um, and then um, approaches for opening up. And um, I, I can point you to where there's advice, but again, these decisions will be up to schools, communities, state governments. So the phases of COVID-19, and, and this is something we very quickly learned. And very quickly learned, I, I should lay out, early on in the um, pandemic, early on meaning just a few months ago, um, I was seeing, well, there's a hospital where I was hunkered down with one other infectious disease doctor. We reached 150 COVID cases in-house at one point. Um, so we were seeing tremendous number of these cases. When you have that unfortunate experience, um, you get to really see a lot, um, you know, hundreds of cases of COVID-19 and what happens in the various stages. So we began to realize that there was this early pre-symptomatic phase, and this is probably one of the most frightening aspects of COVID-19, is that people are shedding virus before they even know that they're sick, before they have any symptoms. Um, then this first week where they feel kind of crummy, feel like a normal viral thing they're used to, but then it's week two, and this is when there's this, what we describe as a cytokine storm, this massive um, immune response in a subset of people 
which is what ends up getting them to the hospital. We're gonna go through each of these phases. Then there's this clotting phase where people are having strokes, they're having pulmonary clots, um, they're losing limbs. Um, and then this late um, hyperinflammatory phase, which is really what has been an issue for us um, in children, I'm beginning to realize that it's not just children, it may actually be an issue in um, older individuals as well. So let me just sort of walk you through the experience with these different phases. So we'll start with the pre-symptomatic phase. Um, and what we're realizing here is people shed virus before they have any symptoms. And this is really a challenge when we talk about our standard, um, you know, we call it the Tetris. So the um, test, identify, um, isolate. Um, so this is a problem because these people are shedding and we don't know who these people are at this point. Um, and we, we suspect, or unfortunately, um, it looks as though much of the spread was occurring before symptoms. The virus is probably at the highest level before people have any symptoms. And that, that's somewhat unique with uh, COVID-19. Um, then you move into this viral phase. You know, initially you got reports of trouble breathing, fever, you know, sort of a classic um, triad of symptoms. Um, we realize now that for every one of these, it's you can have the symptom or not. You might feel this general malaise or not. You might have a fever or not. You might have a cough, might be productive, might be non-productive. You might not. And I'll say actually at this point in time in the New York area, um, only... 20% of the people that we're diagnosing with COVID-19 have what we would in any way consider classic symptoms. So we were just getting the tip of the iceberg. This was part of our problem, is the COVID viral symptom phase is so broad that it cannot be distinguished clinically. And as pointed, people can be infected, shedding the virus, and have no symptoms at all. Um, so we see people come in with balance issues. They fell down. Now we realize it was because of COVID-19. The next is the cytokine storm phase. Um, and actually this, we were you know, seeing so many patients in the New York area, we were one of the, uh, the groups to actually identify this. Um, and this is where a person um, will, within 24 hours, go from a little bit of trouble breathing to being on a ventilator or dead. And so this isn't the, I feel crummy, it's getting worse. Um, unfortunately, what we saw early on before we really were aware is the person might call the doctor, they might say, you know what, why don't you just rest and we'll check in tomorrow. There may not be a check in tomorrow. So this became really critical. Um, we used a lot of telehealth, a lot of other services to really keep in touch with our patients so that um, you would quickly identify um, you'd notice first the respiratory rate. People would start breathing very quickly. They might even um, have low oxygen levels in the blood. And that was a really um, significant warning sign. Um, but you needed to be ready to respond quickly to get these people to care when they need it. It's quite a bit different um, from some of our other illnesses where there's a much more gradual onset. Um, a lot of interesting stuff about what, what drives this. This is actually a... Um, a article under review where we actually, for those of you in the audience who, who care about cytokines, um, there's actually a specific um, elevation of a certain chemical messenger be, between cells, which um, looks like it's driving this. So this is um, something that we're trying to understand how to treat. Um, the next is the clotting phase. I actually was asked yesterday to be um, on the panel that's gonna make national recommendations on how to address this. But um, this coagulation phase, well, what does that mean? Um, so during the third week, right, first week you felt crummy, sec second week you developed the respiratory and this massive inflammatory response. The third week we started seeing that people were developing clots in the venous system. So they might have clots in the, in the lower legs. They may even have large clots that end up in the lungs. They may even have clots on the other side in the arteries where um, we had a gentleman um, one morning, he was doing well otherwise, the respiratory issues weren't even that bad. He said, you know what, my, my right foot, it's kind of cold, it's kind of numb. And he had a large blockage in the artery to the right leg. Um, a lot of people are losing fingers, toes, limbs because of that. The arterial blockages may be an arterial um, blood supply to the brain. So we were seeing people in their 40s showing up in the emergency room, never really got that sick early on. Now they're having a stroke in their 30s, 40s, 50s. So, so about a 20 to 30 fold increased risk in strokes in young individuals, right? So something you know, we weren't really thinking would be an issue. Um, here's just sort of a nice picture, if you want us to call it nice, of a big clot 
blocking the lungs. Um, but you know, here we have a, a series of someone 52, someone 60, 68, with these massive clots ending up in their lungs. Um, this is actually um, the arterial side, another paper that um, we published on this, where um, individuals can, as mentioned, actually get a blockage to an artery. Now you're no longer giving blood supply to a limb, a finger, um, and people are losing toes, fingers. And now this, this has really become um, the last and the biggest issue is we kind of thought, my gosh, this, this virus, it just keeps giving, right? You feel like you, you made it through that initial viral phase, the cytokine storm, you, you did what you could about the clots. And now we, initially it was a, a hospital in the city uh, reported about 15 children coming in with this late hyperinflammatory phase. Once the phone calls started going around, we realized right out here at the nearby children's hospital, we had 30 of these kids coming in. Um, then we started seeing it in older individuals, not just under 20, but people into their 20s and older. Um, and so in this, this late stage, um, we were seeing a number of things. One is an inflammation of the vessels. And these might be the vessels that supply blood to the heart. Um, we're seeing children um, come in with heart attacks, um, you know, three, four weeks. Some of them, we never even knew they had COVID-19, but now that we can do um, blood tests looking for the immune response, we can see that um, in the last few weeks they had it. We usually can get a good story of an exposure, um, but we're seeing this inflammation of the blood vessels, vasculitis. We're also seeing several patients develop quadriplegia. Suddenly they're completely paralyzed, no reflexes, they can't move. Um, this does also look like it's um, a late development. Um, far as calculating the risks that go with COVID-19, um, uh, just to sort of put that late stage in context, we still do think that being young is ideal. Younger people are at significantly lower risk of death and bad outcomes from, from being older. Um, I think that this is chronological age, not you know immaturity. I've been trying to be a little immature myself, hopefully some protective aspect, but it's not helping. Um, but as we see, when we get to about 50 years of age, that's when we really start seeing the risk go up. In our people over the age of 80, that's the highest risk across all the different populations that have reported. Um, fortunately, we're staying 1% or less as far as mortality in people who are under the age of 60, particularly under the age of 50. So age is a huge um, determinant of the risk of an individual having a bad outcome. Um, death is what we're looking at here um, in this data. And what about testing, right? I was just um, asked today to, to write a few lines sort of explaining the importance of testing. Um, and I have to say, this is a little complicated, so I wanna just make sure that people understand, because you, you go for a test, right? You know, is it positive, is it negative? Um, but the whole issue is, what does that mean and what are we testing for? So um, this is uh, some of my colleagues here in our um, hazmat suits. Um, and I'll say this is one of the things that we were quite proud of as an organization. They're actually doing a frontline movie about us. Um, so you'll be able to see me played as myself. Um, but we set up, uh, we started uh, mobilizing back in February. We actually identified the first case of COVID-19 as community spread in the New York area. And um, it actually took quite a bit of back and forth with the CDC at that point, because um, at that point, it was sort of a circular argument. We're only testing travelers because we've only seen it in travelers. And so you're not going to see it unless it's in a traveler. And we pointed out that unless you started testing non-travelers, you would never get a positive test in a non-traveler. But hopefully our audience can see the logic of that, that we had. Um, but we set up the testing. And the first testing that we did, and still this is the cornerstone of testing, we are testing individuals to see if they have the virus, so an active virus infection. Um, we're testing for the genetic material. Um, so this is an amplification um, test that we're doing. Um, I know this has been described as a beautiful test, but it involves a Q-tip being put all the way up your nose, much farther than um, you would ever want a Q-tip put up your nose, swabbing it around, and then we're doing a test um, to see if the virus is there. Um, we've done some testing to see if we can replace this with oral swabs, which um, looks like there's some efficacy there. Um, but this is how we make that initial diagnosis. Does the person have the virus or not? Um, the specificity, you know, if it comes back positive, pretty reliable as far as, um, yes, this is this, you're not picking up something else, but how sensitive? Um, a lot of our um, numbers are coming back saying, you know what, 
even when someone is sick, even when someone has the virus, even if we, you know, test them multiple times, we may miss it 20% of the time on that initial test. Um, and as the prevalence change, I'm going to spend a little time because I think this is important. Um, that's a problem. Because if we think someone's negative, we say you're negative, you can then go into that setting with everyone else. Um, they may still, still be shedding virus. We may be missing, you know, I say 80%, you know, 90%. You know, my kids think that's a great grade in school, right? Um, I probably thought it was a great grade back in school. But uh, <laughs> it's not great when you miss that and then you send someone shedding virus into a group setting and they all get it. Um, the other type of testing, which is new to us, and we're just, um, I like to say road testing, is serology testing. This is, you get a blood test, have I had it? Did I have it already? Um, we're really careful because we don't know if that means that you're now immune. Everyone thinks of that as I'll have a blood test and I'll get my immunity passport and I'll be fine. A um, couple things with the coronaviruses, um, the COVID viruses, is they have the ability to prevent us from at least the other coronaviruses, from mounting a long-term effective immune response, um, a protective one. So other coronaviruses, people have gotten sick. A few months later, they've actually gotten sick again. Um, same coronavirus. So we don't know yet with this testing of antibodies, which everyone's so excited about, what does it actually mean? And this just gives a little bit of that, what I was talking about. You know, when it's a low prevalence disease, when only 1% of the population has it, well, without a test, I could say 99% certainty you don't have it. That's just the prevalence. And if we have a test um, that's even not so sensitive, and this is kind of where we are with some of our tests, well, we get it up a little higher than that 99% to 99.9. Um, but now we start running into issues with, um, you know, how, how accurate is this? If it, if it is positive, Actually, most of the people were not positive. And then as the prevalence goes up, it changes. So um, when, you're, when you're looking at opening schools, things like that, and the prevalence is very low, um, you're going to be pretty good at telling someone that they're negative. Um, but once your prevalence gets up to 10% in your community, you're going to miss about 10% of the people that are infected. And that, that's going to be an issue, right? Because we want to test people before they get on an airplane. We want to test people before they get into a community situation. If that prevalence starts to rise, if we're not really good at keeping it at a low prevalence, we start losing our ability to really find out and say someone's truly negative. Um, now, I'm just going to finish with the last couple slides here. And this is just um, the phased approach to reopening that we're going through here in the New York area. Um, and there's a bunch of numbers and parameters that our governor is using. Um, and the idea is they have education, recreation um, down as sort of a phase four, a lower priority. Um, we're actually arguing that they should be a higher priority because, you know, how are people going to return to work? How are people ever going to be trained to work if this isn't a higher priority? Um, but we're waiting and we're sitting and following um, government um, recommendations and mandates on this. And New York is still um, effectively paused. So um, everything other than phase one um, and physicians essential services, everyone else is still basically at home. Um, fortunately, we're starting to get um, recommendations um, from professional organizations. Um, WHO is um, basically saying um, there's certain things you should be thinking about, um, considerations for school-related public health measures in the context. And hopefully I've given you a little bit of the information that they um, suggest is important. So just understanding um, COVID-19 transmission and severity, um, particularly in children, right? If you're looking at school-related and, you know, children uh, apparently is a little loose term when you start getting up into university levels. Um, then everyone sort of um, suggests it's important that you pay attention to the local situation. That prevalence is really going to have a big impact upon your ability to figure out who's truly negative when you look at opening things back up. If you're down at about a 1%, if you've done a really good job of flattening that curve, you have a much better chance of saying someone is negative and, and getting it right. Um, and then number three is each school is a little bit different. Is it a community school with a lot of porous, ac porous activities where, you know, people are coming and going? Is it more of a closed system? Um, because that, that set point, that 1%, that 10%, that's where you start. Um, but if there's a lot of movement in and out, it's more of a challenge. Um, the thing I think about schools as well, and, and a lot of parts of our community, is they're not just places where um, we're 
younger individuals go to learn, where maybe they go for a social experience, um, people are working these environments. So it's really the same kind of parameters as um, looking at the initial workplace, what are the, what's the context, um, but then using all the things that we've now learned about. Um, all these preventive measures, um, washing your hands. You know, when you go to a restaurant and there's a little sign, you know, they say the staff has to wash their hands, not just the staff. I encourage all individuals to wash their hands. Um, the distancing, the grouping, reducing travel, um, tracking contacts. That's the new area that we're getting towards is that if we can get the numbers low enough, when someone gets sick, we can figure out who is at risk, who may have been exposed um, and help those people um, early identify and hopefully not spread it to their friends, family, loved ones. Um, but all this has got to be put together with a plan of action that balances all the, the rights and risks of individuals, which is probably um, sort of the forte of this group. So I wanted to thank you. And um, just as Greg mentioned, um, a few few links here. I'm uh, the president of ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. It's an NGO. Um, we, our big initial mission was um, parasitic diseases throughout the world. I do a lot of global health work. Um, but uh, we've also converted our parasitic um, disease organization, Parasites Without Borders. So it's a place where we keep a lot of updated literature, um, updated links for um, providers, clinicians, and the lay public. Um, and This Week in Virology, it's a podcast. Uh, it was not as popular as it now is, probably up to 50, 100,000 listeners every episode. So a lot of people listening and we try to give people um, solid science, hopefully in a way that's accessible to the public. So you're getting information you can count on in a, in a time when, boy, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of it's not reliable. Um, and also I am, you know, if people want to reach out, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, got my email up there for you as well. So let me unscreen share and I'll turn it back. All right, thank you, Dan, uh, Dr. Griffin. We appreciate uh, you sharing all this with us. So helpful. Jason, okay, you're unmuted. I wanna turn it over to you, Jason, uh, Dr. Patowski, and, and uh, hear how you all, um, some of these issues and then we'll get around to some community questions uh, so please yeah yeah I mean this you're such a wealth of wisdom I don't even know where to start to begin asking questions and I know that a lot of the students and faculty who are listening in on this zoom have some more questions but I do someone posted a question in the Q&A box right before you even started and it's probably worth getting ahead of which is uh, the question of, of trust. I mean, you clearly have a very robust science background. And right now, average everyday um, students um, and, and Americans are getting just blasted with information from all over the place. Um, who, who do we trust as a trustworthy source of information and especially because uh, it was just, if you read in the question Q&A box that I, I'm going to guess a student had asked, um, when the CDC is coming under such, um, under such criticism for how they are collecting their data and making their guidelines. You know, of course, you ask an easy one to start with there, Jason. So thank you. <laughs> I thought we were going to get along. <laughs> no, this is actually a really tough time. Um, and I know early on in the in the epidemic, I felt like suddenly all the rules had been thrown out. And I, I did a talk at one point about how people were practicing medicine and how um, information was being disseminated. And it's a little um, crazy to me how aspects of this virus has become have become partisan right um, I would have thought a, a tragedy facing it would have drawn us all together there would have been a way to to come together and and get the information we needed and sort of in a cooperative manner um, but as you as you bring up um, the the CDC is a government organization um, there are people whose basically livelihood depends upon them doing sort of what they're told etc um, the, the CDC I, I will say it has always been, I think, a very good source of information. Um, they they did fail us with testing. I think we all agree, and th that was a bit embarrassing for all of us that that happened. Um, but I don't think they failed us as far as um, giving us information. And and most of us look to the CDC. And actually, when we feel like there's an issue, we we reach out. And actually, I I get emails probably once a week. Maybe you know, hey Dan, would you look at something and feedback? And so. Um, 
other than the testing early on, which I think really hurt the CDC as far as their reputation, um, I think the CDC remains a really good, reliable source of sound information and guidance. Um, people want them to give information and guidance quicker, um, but I think one of the important things is to be measured and to take your time. It's better to give information a couple days late and be accurate than it is to rush out there and then have to um, step back and, and withdraw recommendations. So I still would say the CDC is an excellent source of information. Um, the, the people at Microbe TV who do the This Week in Virology podcast, um, I've actually worked a lot with them and I reached out to them early on, actually our organization, Pro Healthcare Associates in New York, reached out to them and basically said, would you be willing to create a venue for all the clinicians that want updates and the nice thing is there's a group of half a dozen um, scientists who are there. Um, I do kind of this weekly guest star thing, um, but then they discuss like, so what did Dr. Griffin say? And does that make sense? And he talked about this vaccine trial or he talked about remdesivir. And so um, that's another, I'll say, you know, you can listen to it while you're in your car or while you're trapped in your home in New York, sheltering at home. Um, but what I do warn people is don't get your news from the media, right? Don't think that the media is going to give you the solid science that, that you want to really feel informed. So be careful because, right, their, their job is to sell advertising. Um, that's nothing, nothing wrong there. Um, I think actually a lot of the media outlets have done a really good job, not all of them. Um, but, yeah, you're better off going to places where the, the scientists are giving you advice rather than just a media reporter. You know, one, one of the things that really impressed me on your presentation, which I, I think is, is, you know, as, as a question for especially the students that are listening in, this is a very humbling virus. I mean, it, we've only known about it for six months. And based on the fact it's only been around for six months, we've accumulated all this data. And anyone who knows anything about this virus um, uh, ad addresses it with incredible respect and with incredible transparency of all the limitations of everything we know. And uh, I, I'm interested in just in how you conduct yourself in such a, you know, the CAP Center for, for Ethics and, and Political Life is, you know, addresses some of the, the political polarizing nature of this. And you do it so diplomatically and as such a scientist saying, no, 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 the, I mean, these are your beliefs. The, these are the numbers and these are the educated decisions we can make about the numbers. And I'm wondering if you can kind of comment on that, on that approach that, that you and your colleagues do so well. No, I mean, I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, one of, one of the presentations we did early on was sort of talking about this issue about how, how do we as clinicians um, deal with this crisis? Um, and, you know, initially it was, I'll say, frightening. It was scary. And there was a period of time where I think uh, that it made us rethink, like, how do we make clinical decisions? Because um, early on, we, we were seeing this, we were not used to it. As clinicians, we were used to people come in, you at least have a, a range of different options, you have some knowledge about how effica efficacious different things are. And you know, most of our patients do well, whether we do something or not, right? We're used to good outcomes. Um, but suddenly COVID-19 changed everything. Um, I tell the story of one of my colleagues who was a cardiologist, he cross-trained to work in the ICU. Um, he'd been at home for a couple weeks. Um, feeling kind of useless, but then he was so excited to come in the first day and join us in the ICU. And by 9 a.m., four of his patients had already died in front of his eyes. And there was a, there was a stress, um, there was a fear there, um, there was a being outside your element um, that I think was really tough on a lot of people. And one of the first things people did, a lot of people did, was, well, let's just try everything um, with the idea that maybe they would stumble across something, maybe something would stick to the wall, so to speak. Um, but again, it was a lot of communication. And I went through a little bit how we approach decision making in medicine. And, and historically, we had approached it through evidence based medicine. And, and I have to admit, I'm old enough for that to be a new concept. Um, I remember when I was going through my training and, and we were going through, there was a, a proper trial, it was placebo control, and it showed that one therapy, one intervention was clearly superior to another. And there was an older physician there who said, are you trying to tell me that this one well-controlled scientific trial is more reliable than my 30 years of experience? And we all looked amongst ourselves and said, yes. Um, and that's what medicine became. We really had evidence um, that we could rely on that would let us know how patients would do. 
Um, but some things happened. When this first happened, there was a lot of people that retreated to the sort of eminence-based approach to medicine. And this is you find the oldest physician, you know, with the highest title, and you ask them to drop some guidelines. Please, you tell us what to do because things are going poorly, and I don't want this to be my responsibility. Um, and, uh, you know, the fearful words of, you know, in my experience, I say the three most frightening words yeah. in medicine. Um, and, and these are the individuals that we say who have been making the same mistakes with increasing confidence over an impressive number of years. And we're asking them to guide us into the unknown. But how do you practice evidence-based medicine when there's so little evidence and this, this, this illness is so new? So what we, what we sort of fell into was something that, um, in a sense, was, was a combination of evidence-based medicine when we could get it and experience-based medicine as we were experiencing the day-to-day. -day. Um, so um, early on when we first started seeing what we were perceiving as a cytokine storm, right, this massive inflammatory response, um, some of us started drawing blood levels, looking at like, well, trying to understand what was the nature of this inflammatory response. And then saying, we're seeing these massive surges of interleukin-6. We're seeing this massive inflammatory surge. Um, if we try to calm that down, will patients do better? So you started noticing some clinicians were using steroids. Some clinicians were trying to block IL-6 and noticing, hey, patients seem to be getting better. Then we ran into that next stage where we started seeing like, are really all our patients having clots? And we organized it and looked at a lot of patients who were having clots. Um, and we realized, oh my gosh, the majority or actually came out to be about 40% of our patients who were very ill were having clots. So what we did is that we said, we know how to treat clots. So we went back to evidence-based medicine with regard to how do we treat clots. Um, other people started realizing, well, maybe this clotting is a little bit different. Maybe there's inhibitors here like we see in lupus. Started looking for that. And when we found them using the evidence we had about how to treat them. Um, the proning, I don't know if you've heard about proning. Maybe some people have. This was very interesting. The, the pediatricians call it tummy time. Yes, we call it tummy time now too. <laughs> Add a little bit of light to our day. But um, we initially had this gentleman, he became famous as the Irish patient, one of the first patients that we did this, um, young man um, who got incredibly ill. The percent of oxygen was dropping from the 90s down into the low 80s. Um, and the intensive care unit physician, I were taught, what are we going to do? This man is dying in front of us. Um, and she said, you know what? Some people with this acute respiratory distress strendum, we prone them, we put them on their, we, you know, he's going to die if we don't do something. And so that was the first time we turned this gentleman on which, his which, ma which makes sense to me as a clinician, but and I think a lot of the audience don't come from a medical background. Yeah, I was wondering if you can explain exactly taking someone who's either on a ventilator or <laughs> almost on a ventilator, what that entails. Yeah, so this gentleman was laying on their back, they're on a ventilator, so they've got a tube into their windpipe, into their trachea. Um, they're on a ventilator, they've got 100% oxygen, we're doing everything we can to support them, but the oxygen level in their blood is dropping, dropping, and we know when it gets to a certain point, their heart's gonna stop, they're gonna die. And we took that individual, it's not as thin as we would have hoped at the time, we created a um, proning team, so we had six people, and we took this gentleman from their back, and we rotated him, so he's now belly down. And by doing that, it basically created a better match between the blood supply to the lungs and the aeration of his lungs, the oxygen. And so within a few minutes, the oxygen level in the blood went up into the 90s. So it was dramatic to see before our own eyes, which is that, that's one of those, no clinical trial, no randomized evidence, but this really but, but sort of also for, experience. For, for everyone in the, in, in the audience who, who is, a, is a student of history, this is really an epidemic at an unprecedented time where our ability to gather information while we're treating patients and then share it with people all over the world in real time. I'm, at least in my career as a physician, I've never read so many pre-publication journals <laughs> per day. Um, and it's really extraordinary what we as a world have been mobilized to do in the last six months. You know, that is the amazing thing, like what I brought up with the, with the clotting that we were seeing in the lungs. So, you know, it was a whole group of us. And, you know, basically, this seems like it's going on. Are these people really getting clots in their lungs. So within um, about two hours, we had scanned 10 people. We had seen that, you know, all but one of them had massive clots in the arteries to their lungs. Um, we were then able to put them on anticoagulation. 
um, and dissolve, basically let those clots dissolve, and then very quickly disseminate that information to our other colleagues. So within a matter of a few days, an entire healthcare system of 22 hospitals um, was already aware that this was an issue and responding to it and um, reached out to the CDC and very quickly the CDC you know, published this report, let the world know on you know, the CDC emerging infectious disease. So very quickly in a matter of hours, figured out why our patients were doing so poorly, very quickly was able to disseminate this to all our um, hospitals and then to the other infectious disease doctors in the community and then quickly to the world through the help of the CDC. Let me ask you this question. There's two questions that are propagating a lot in the Q&A section. One is about ethics and the other is about mental health. But since you had mentioned um, about your, your colleagues kind of coming in and really being pushed in their comfort zone, first of all, how, how are you and, and your, your interdisciplinary team of, of healers, how are you holding up given that you've been in, in the trenches? And, and the next question is, the impact that this pandemic is having, not only on, on you and your team, who's taking care of patients with very limited knowledge and limited tools to be able to combat it, but also the impact that the shelter in place is having on the collective mental health um, uh, of, our, of our nation. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll address our mental health well-being first. Um, you know, there, there's not a person among us who at some point hasn't reached that, that low. And, um, and the lowest, actually, I don't know if people are aware, but uh, the head of our emergency um, medicine uh, group at one of the Columbia hospitals actually committed suicide. So it, it got pretty bad, to be honest. Um, you know, I, re I reached a point myself even where, um, you know, it was one day this gentleman came in and I'm talking to him one day, and then the next day, basically, he drowns, you know, blood in his lungs. And this is a gentleman with, you know, six kids, the uh, youngest one at home is two. And, you know, you're FaceTiming with the wife, your husband is dying, and, you know, and she's home and not with him. Um, there have definitely been some really tough times. I don't know anyone who hasn't had that point, um, you know, after that experience. The next morning, it was a Friday morning. I was like, I just don't want to go to work. I just want to stay in bed. I don't want to go and you know, how many of my patients will die today? Um, you know, between yesterday and today, only three of my patients died. That, that's a good day. And then, and then while they're dying, because of these robust social distancing policies and visitation guidelines, their family members can't be there to be with them as yeah. they're dying. Or you're in a full PPE spacesuit taking care of someone, and there's just this huge barrier between you and these patients while they're really suffering. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, if if... They're, they're dying alone, and that is really tragic. So, um, you know, I like to point out that, you know, every day people watch the numbers like it's, you know, some sort of sports event, but every one of those numbers is someone's mom, someone's dad, someone's sister, someone, you know, who's dying alone in the hospital, isolated. Um, it's, you know, and, and to see that every day, I mean, most of us did not go into medicine um, with the expectation or, or that as a, an experience. So, um, so for us in healthcare, it's been it's been tremendous. Um, it's been really difficult. Um, it's been really hard. Um, I think that sharing those experiences amongst ourselves has been helpful. Um, I spent a lot of time, um, and I still do, in the intensive care unit where it's where most people are dying, um, and really trying to check in with each other. A few of us checked in today. Um, I really appreciated one of my partners gave me a call last night about 5.30 and was like, hey, you know, you looked like you were having a tough time yesterday. And I was like, yeah, I actually was. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, I think reaching out to, it, helping each other through these difficult times has really made this possible. And, um, you know, as intellectual and as fascinating and as challenging, um, the, the human tragedy, the emotional, the mental health side is hard. Um, but not just on those, those of us in the hospital, um, all these people who are trying to shelter in place, trying to help um, stem the tide, flatten the curve, um, really hard. And not just the social isolation, um, but the economic uncertainty. Um, a lot of people have lost jobs, um, even people in academia, right? A lot of the adjunct professors are out of work. Um, a lot of us actually in medicine, a lot of my surgical colleagues, um, they're basically, they're out of work. Their practices are failing. Um, so here we are working these ridiculous hours and thinking like, you know, my practice may not survive when, when this is over. So it's, it's really tough on so many levels. It's tough on the emotional level to just see this much death, 
to see people dying alone without their loved ones with us. Um, and then just all the, the tragedy in the community. Which is, which is interesting because, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, every community is having a local dialogue, but we're also having a national dialogue and thinking about um, what, what is the, the greater harm uh, this virus and how this virus just wreaks havoc on people in certain age brackets, in certain socioeconomic uh, communities. Uh, certainly uh, it, in, in uh, African-American urban communities and in the Native American communities has a high, uh, a much higher mor morbidity mortality, but at the same time with the economic impact of shelter in place, um, people run the risk of the slow squeeze of poverty, malnutrition, mental health decline. And we're having this debate about which harm is the easier pill to swallow while we think about what our next steps are. And I know that as the CAP Center for, for Public Life, probably there's a lot of people who are thinking, what are, what's your advice? Is because you, you talk about reopening and stages. And I know that our governor here in California just commented, that you know, we're gonna start moving towards stage two, at least certain counties. Well, we in Santa Barbara County are gonna start working towards stage two. What advice can you give us as someone who's seen what this virus can do if we reopen too fast? Yeah, um, we know it's tough. And one of the things that I found very upsetting was um, you know, early on we started, we, we identified and actually our group um, did quite a bit when they when they paused New York we had done a great job of testing actually other than the state we identified the vast majority of the cases in New York they pause um, a lot of the people who are able to uh, particularly the more affluent people they shelter in place at a nice comfortable home they've got TV and internet and all the other things to keep them entertained um, but somehow they were able to figure out that landscapers were, were an essential service because otherwise the grass would grow and we would get tick bites and all die apparently. Mm -hmm. So what we started to see was all the Hispanic landscapers coming in. First it was the husband, then it was the wife, and then it was the rest of the family um, because this was a part of society that was not sheltering in place that was still either cleaning people's houses or doing outdoor construction or doing landscaping. And then, you know, the three or four of them would pack across the bench seat of the pickup truck, get back home. One of them would get infected, spread it to these large multi-generation family settings. And so we were seeing firsthand in the hospital, um, this large influx of the economically challenged, largely Hispanic um, populations. And it was, you know, the husband and wife, it was the whole family ending up in the hospital and a lot of them not making it. Um, and that was really tough to see because you saw the economic inequality was putting these people in, in a position um, and they didn't really have a choice in, in certain ways because, you know, if they shelter at home, where's the food? Where's the money to buy the food? A lot of these people are living, you know, hand to mouth pretty much. And now they're in this high exposure environment. So I found that personally very upsetting. In a lot of ways, as we, ha as you had mentioned, it's it, it's a, you know, we live in very political polarizing times, and in a lot of ways, this this epidemic is amplifying that. And what we're seeing in certain communities that have already been uh, afflicted by uh, structural violence, institutional racism, they already have a predisposition to diabetes, morbid obesity, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease. All of these are predictors for having a much worse outcome once they become sick and they're more likely to live in a much more densely populated um, living situation. And yeah. the virus in a lot of ways is, 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 is pulling that back. Um, yeah. There's been a lot of questions about, about ethics. Um, and I, you know, I, as someone who is in the trenches as an infectious disease doctor and a scientist, you know, a, a lot of our students with medical humanities, um, you know, they're studying the STEM um, you know, the science, the molecular biology, the virology, but now in this pandemic is showing that an understanding of distributive justice, uh, utilitarian ethics, you know, how, what advice can you give these students and what can you comment on about the allocation of ventilators, the allocation of some of these experimental medications that may or may not work? How do we allocate them in a just way for maximum benefit um, for some of these communities that are just getting overwhelmed? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent question. Um, early on when we were having problems with testing, we, we heard that, you know, okay, so our testing is starting to get backed up. The delay is longer than we want. But then we heard, oh, one of the other um, 
organizations um, has this rapid 48 hour turnaround with testing. So I, oh, this is great. So I had one of my, I said, oh, reach out to them and find out like if we have high priority people where we really need to know, we can send them over there. And then we quickly found out, no, no, this was a, um, a VIP service for basically rich donors. And I must admit, I was quite upset. The idea that you would take a limited resource that when you pulled that away resulted in people dying and you were basically saying, oh, you have a lot of money, you're gonna get access to this test. And by the way, people are not gonna get that test and it's gonna encumber us, it's gonna prevent us from making decisions that we need to make. People are gonna die as a consequence of that behavior. And so I think for all the people that are, um, you know, following this, um, there's really a lot to lot to see here. Um, a lot of ideas like, oh, we're going to trade off on certain things. Um, you know, the capitalist distribution of access to care. You know, um, you know, this is a, a very interesting time when it makes you rethink. I mean, um, the idea that if you, as we saw, like as I described, if you had enough money to shelter comfortably in place, you were much likely to survive the last couple months in the New York area. If you were um, really living hand to mouth and somehow your area of the economy was considered um, important or essential to the people who were comfortably sheltering in place, um, you were exposed and at and a significantly higher um, chance of dying. And I think we've also seen, um, I think, blatant um, institutionalized racism, right? Where, you know, I, I remember the individual who, um, he was a man of color. He went to the emergency room. He had COVID-19. He was quite ill. He was told to go home, take a whole bunch of ibuprofen, and come back if he felt worse. And he did come back a few days later. At that point, he was in kidney failure and proceeded to die within the day. Um, that's, you know, if this was a well-spoken white person, would they have been treated the same way? I, unfortunately, I suspect not. Um, uh, the, oh, yeah, correct. A second. No worries. Um, letting the pendulum swing in the direction of um, modest optimism. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe not. Let's see where this goes. Um, you were an early advocate for the idea of um, small social cohorts. That is, yes. beyond your immediate family, if the right conditions were available. And if I remember right, that was at least a month ago you advocated for that, or at least pitched it as a possible way to soften some of the um, mental health issues we're talking about, sense of isolation, particularly with children. Could you say how you feel about that idea now? Particularly, it's gotten some media attention on Slate and CNN and so forth. So um, say something about that. And while I have the mic here, say something also uh, about the fact that you have a child who's in college and how are you feeling about that as a parent? Um, the prospect of the fall and what are the what's worrying you and what's giving you some sense of optimism about her possible future at college? Yeah, well, let me address both of those. Um, you know, so one of the things that I did early on and it was interesting um, in that I was willing to speak on Fox News, I was willing to be on CNN, I would be interviewed by NPR later the same day. Um, I tried as much as I could to not make this a partisan issue and to say, let's all like be realistic here. Uh, and when we talked about the social cohorting, um, there was a whole mental health aspect, an isolation aspect to this that I was concerned about early on, particularly looking at the Chinese experience. Um, if you take a young individual, let's say we'll take 20, the, the imaginary 22-year-old single person, and you say you're going to stay locked up in your you know, one-room apartment by yourself for the next two months, um, that's just not healthy. And we have seen a lot of negative. We've seen drug overdoses. We've seen suicides. We, we've seen basically that is a harmful potential issue. Um, so very early on, I, I coined a couple phrases. It was funny because at the time they're like, is that a word? <laughs> and so the, the couple things that I coined was the social cohort. That was, they're like, is there such a thing? And I was like, well, yes, there is. Um, the other was the um, quarantine, which I thought was maybe more savvy. That's a for little the... dorky, Dan. But... <laughs> <laughs> but I think that um, I was trying to get into that younger generation idea. Um, but the idea is if you ask people to do things that are just untenable and unsustainable, at some point people are going to say, I can't do this. Um, and so one of the things I suggested early on was, okay, if you're a young person in your 20s, 
you know, maybe you're a young person in your fifties, <laughs> um, you know, and you're living by yourself. Actually, it probably doesn't matter how old you are, um, but form a small sort of group. And I, and I did actually give recommendations on um, potential size, like don't make it above eight people. Um, you need to think about trust. You need to think about who's going to be in that dynamic. Um, you know, if there's a boyfriend, girlfriend who are inseparable, they pretty much need to be on the same quarantine and the same social cohort. Um, because this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Um, this is going to go on for a while. And um, so, you know, early on, this is something I'm not sure which side of the aisle was happy with this recommendation or not. But hopefully everyone was because we did see the harms that I, I predicted we would see. We saw that if you socially isolate individuals, um, it's not going to go well. And we saw, we saw deaths. We saw the suicides. We saw the drug overdoses. Um, I had really the unfortunate experience where the ward clerk in our um, intensive care unit her brother, who was actually a teacher himself, um, ended up um, dying in the hospital. And then his socially isolated son, who was by himself when he heard the news, ended up overdosing and dying. So um, there, there's dangers to, um, there's impacts to all the things that we might ask people to do. Um, so I think, it's, I think it was important. I still, I still like my advice, um, forming these small um, social cohorts so that you're not just one person all by themselves. Um, so it is something that is sustainable. Um, and then still the same you know, things I put out. There's a fidelity commitment here. Um, you can't cheat on your social cohort. Um, you can't then go and, you know, and then come back and then infect the whole group. You know, this is more than you. This is, a, uh, this is an ethical issue. This is a public health. This is a community issue. Um, and, and as, as someone, can I just ask a question? Because I think this is really important. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm a dad. I have a three-year-old son. And our three-year-old son has two families that he plays with. Both of them come from either ICU or emergency medicine families, right? And no, it's like exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So, so as we're thinking about our, our quarantine or our quarantine pod or, or all these wonderful meme names, who, who's at risk? Who should we be thinking, okay, you know what? I, I'm going to stay in this group of eight people, but I, this person here maybe is over age 80 or this person has had a, 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 a kidney transplant or is on chemotherapy. I don't feel comfortable with them being in my cohort because I work in the hospital and I'm high risk for being an asymptomatic carrier. What, mm -hmm. what advice can you give as far as who's risk of doing poorly and who should we be thinking about being in our, our, our pod or our team? Yeah, and um, and this is this is you know I, I never like the phrase of like trade offs, but I, but I am comfortable with the idea of people making risk assessments and making decisions. Um, no, nothing in the world is safe, right? Uh, but there are things in the world that are safer. So my parents, for instance, are in their they're in their eighties, um, so they are separately socially isolated by themselves, and and I, I don't visit them. I feel like that would be too much of a risk to take, just based upon the age. If if they got sick it's almost 50-50 that one of them would not make it. Um, so they're a high risk group. Uh, but then if you have a group of people, I think we use the example of people in their 20s or 30s, um, you're now getting into less than 1% chance that someone will die. So these are decisions that I think people can make. Um, age is the easiest one to just sort of look at the slides that I showed. Um, but obesity increases your risk. Hypertension increases your risk. Um, basically having these other, you know, so. I'll just sort of list them. So the older you are, the worse. The heavier you are, worse. Um, hypertension, diabetes, um, you know, any any malignancy or issues like that. Um, but yeah, so so there there can be a calculation that that each individual should make and a group should make. Um, you know, I, I know Greg's uh, one of his sons is actually um, friends with the son of someone who works in medicine. And, uh, you know, he early on asked me, like, so is it okay if that, you know, sort of form this social cohort with the two families? And I was like, well, thank you, because our kids need friends, too. Um, and so, and what we did here is, you know, my family and one other family, we're a sort of a social cohort. Um, and, you know, we work together. And, you know, it, a lot of it is based on the kids, um, because, again, it's untenable. And it's very hard, I think, a mental issue, a mental challenge for young children not to have that critical social interaction. Uh, David, if, if we could um, talk a little bit about how you're thinking about 
college, your own families. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me. Um, yeah. So actually, the people from William and Mary may be listening. <laughs> My, yeah, let, let me just come right out and say it. it, it should we reopen? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so of course I won't answer that directly, but I will discuss my daughter, Daisy. Um, so my, my daughter, uh, oldest daughter, Daisy, um, you know, I love all my children equally, some of them more equally than others, but uh, <laughs> so my oldest daughter, Daisy, uh, was a freshman at William & Mary this, um, this year until that experience was abruptly ended. Um, and there's this whole issue about what, what, you know, what happens? Does she go back to school? Um, what do I personally hope? I'm personally hoping that there's some way to achieve that. Um, do I think it's just going to go back to the old, that it's going to be the same with these, you know, 300 person lectures with everyone sort of packed in there? Um, cheek to jowls, I think is the expression, like at a concert, um, you know, while the lecturer is down in front of the, the massive audience. Do I see that as a great idea? No, uh, I see that as a high risk issue. Uh, the streaming all her classes and having her live in the basement, that's not great either, I think, because um, as Greg Johnson can probably attest for me, um, a lot of college wasn't just learning, but there was a lot of um, maturity that I, I needed to acquire and go through, a lot of growing up that um, social experience as part of the college. Um, so my hope is there's ways to do it, um, but I think ultimately there's going to be a lot of tough decisions about um, how that can be done, um, you know, what are, what are the risks that, um, that each individual is willing to undertake? What are the different measures that different universities can take to make it as safe an experience as possible? Um, and then I think a lot of it is going to be um, state by state governance. Um, we're going to get direction. We're, we're ultimately going to be told um, what we're allowed to do. And then the hope is that we, we do everything um, plus a little bit more. Um, as a sort of model for this, um, one of my other jobs is I'm the chair of the largest sailing program on the North Shore of Long Island. So we are hoping in a little over a month to open a sailing program with over 200 kids. Is that possible? Can we do it safely? Um, I can tell you what we're going to try to do. We are arranging to do the testing of all the children before they go to camp and the families so that we don't have kids coming in, hopefully with with the virus, um, as mentioned, right? We have the potential to miss because of the sensitivity of the test. Um, we're gonna be doing temperature screening every morning and a review of all their, you know, have you been exposed? Have you had any concerning symptoms? A lot of this is as per CDC guidance. Um, another temperature check in the middle of the day, our staff is gonna get screened, our staff will wear masks. The kids actually, interesting enough, are gonna wear these, um, these sailing bandanas, they're these sort of neck scarfs that go around the neck, but you can pull up over your nose. And, and basically the kids are gonna be as much as possible um, masked to help with that. We're gonna have social distancing, small groups. So um, yeah, this is all uncharted waters, right? So um, I'm hoping that each person in this arena shares their knowledge and experiences as well. I have, a, I have a, cu a couple questions for you, and one of them came up on the Q&A box here, which is about the impact this is going to have on healthcare. But I, I don't want to, I, I want to, I want you to prepare for that one first. But, but the question comes up a lot about, about masks, you know, cloth masks, surgical masks, N95 respirators. What should, given the recommendation on, on source control and preventing the spread if we're asymptomatic carriers, what comments can you make to us about wearing a uh, face mask, simple face mask, how it can be used as a, as a public health intervention and, and you know, why the recommendation in the first place? Yeah, I think one of my first interviews, right, was uh, CNN. I think we were, might've still been in February at that point. And one of the questions was about masks. And so we very, we, um, very rapidly in a matter of a few months went from saying, ah, eh, masks, they don't do anything to, you have to wear it or we'll find you, right? So uh, let's follow the, the news cycle. It's been rather interesting. And um, one of the comments I made early on was that if you wear a mask improperly, um, if anything gives you a false sense of security and it is actually not helpful. Um, but once you get to the point where you're in a pandemic, where there's a significant amount of infection in the community, then they have been shown to be effective. And they're effective sort of both ways. Um, they protect you to some degree, but they also protect your neighbor. Um, so um, what, are, what do we recommend? Um, the, nice, the nice thing, one of the few nice things about COVID-19, um, it is really rare um, that it is spread 
airborne, right? I mean, someone vomits, someone's on a respirator. There are certain cir circumstances. Um, so usually the cloth masks are actually excellent, adequate, appropriate for most contexts. The N95s, those, those respirators that really fit on your mouth nice and tight, um, that filter out 95% of the particulate mm -hmm. matter, um, those are important to wear in a situation where something is happening, where COVID-19, where the SARS-CoV-2 virus is floating around in the air and simple act of breathing can expose you. So those I still think should be prioritized for healthcare workers. Um, but what we've seen a lot of the New York area is a lot of these homemade, home sewn, and now commercially sewn um, cloth masks. And those are, those seem to be excellent. And now there's um, a fair number of studies um, that we've basically shared that are now out there. Um, let's say like an 80% reduction in the spread if, if these are properly used. And, and when you look at what that 80% mounts to after a month, given how this virus, the r not the transmissibility of this virus in, in cities it, it, after a month is extraordinary how much they can prevent the spread for a very relatively benign intervention. There's a lot of people, you know, this is the cap center on political life. There's a lot of people who talk a lot about civil liberties and you can't tell me not to wear a mask, but we as, as citizens in society make small concessions to our liberties every day for the public good. We, we wear a seatbelt. We don't smoke in public. We you know, drive the speed limit. And in a lot of ways, a mask, wearing a simple mask out in public can falls very well under that, under that model. Um, yeah, my, my younger brother used to, used to say that your, your freedom to wave your arms ends at the tip of my nose. So you wave your arms, but you start whacking me in the nose and that you've, and with the coughing, with the sneezing, with the droplet mm -hmm. spread, um, you're spreading that within a six foot zone. So if you're going to come within my six foot zone, um, you're, you're going to potentially put my health at danger. And so, yeah, there's, there's a, the community responsibility maybe here. Um, yeah, this, this is a balance. Um, uh, I think, you know, I would say, fortunately, least in the New York area, most people seem very much on board with wearing masks and um, they've become quite stylish. I actually have a mask that matches my bow ties. Um, <laughs> I actually even have head coverings that match as well. Um, you know, women are, are, are having them match their dresses, which is a really nice look. I'm just going with the bow tie match. Um, but, you know, I think there's fun ways to address um, what is a new thing. I, I don't think it has to be perceived as um, an infringement on our civil liberties. I think it can be viewed as, um, you know, holding the door for someone or being polite or, you know, uh, a way of basically um, helping and protecting our neighbors. It's a remarkable act of social solidarity. And, and it's interesting for the medical humanities students that are probably watching who don't understand why it is that pediatricians and infectious disease doctors always wear bow ties instead of neckties. Uh, it's because, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't get germs on your bow tie, right? Yeah, the, the, the tie hanging down is filthy, just <laughs> by the way. People never wash them. Not only do I wear bow ties, but I do wash my bow tie at the end of every day, which you should do. <laughs> let, let, let me ask you this, Dan, because, I, you know, we are, we're, before the SARS-CoV-2 virus hit our shore, we were having a national debate about health care. Is healthcare a human right? Is it the government's responsibility to provide healthcare? What is our role in healthcare? What do you foresee the impact? Uh, if you could get your crystal ball out and you know give us some kind of uh, of uh, you know a uh, 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 future reading, uh, how is this going to impact our healthcare system? What what does the new normal look like on the other side of this? Yeah, I mean, I think that the pandemic has challenged the traditional model of medicine, um, and it's, tr it's challenged in several ways. One is a lot of people have lost their jobs, and with the loss of employment, have lost their health care coverage. Um, the hospitals have also realized that their, their money makers had been surgery, had been all these elective things. Um, during the pandemic, they're all, um, they're all hemorrhaging. They're all suffering financially. And so the the people losing their healthcare coverage, um, the costs and the impact economically uh, make the old system economically um, fairly unviable, untenable, um, particularly at the hospital level. Um, so I foresee this pandemic having a big impact on that national debate. And I actually think there'll be, um, there'll be institutions moving, moving around as far as, as their views on this topic. 
um, you know, one of the one of the hats I wear, um, I think, in my title slide was uh, United Health Group, which um, which I think their slogan is the largest health and wellness um, organization in the world, and. It's interesting because they own like health insurance companies and they own prescription management and they do better when people stay healthy. Um, so it's interesting. We have large players out there who are actually rewarded when people stay healthy. We have other people in the whole healthcare industry who are rewarded when people get sick and need surgery. So it's going to be interesting to see how all those players try to work, how to hopefully play nicely because we need the hospitals. We need the hospitals to survive, but we somehow need to change our approach so that the hospitals can somehow be viable um, as hopefully the people succeed in the upcoming wave in minimizing the number of people that get sick. When is our next surge coming? So everyone asked me that. <laughs> oh, good. I, I always wanted to be included with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to kindergarten. You're now part of the crowd. <laughs> you fit in. You're a popular kid. Um, so, you know, I, I'm hoping we get a couple months and, I, and you know, m maybe this is a little bit of denial. So I will say basically um, by the fall, we're going to be well into the beginning of the next wave. I, I, predict this this coming winter will be one of the darkest winters in American history. Um, I think we're going to get, a, as long as we um, behave ourselves, uh, at least we're seeing in the New York, we can get, you know, a month or two, hopefully, of um, lull and calm. But yeah, as we head into the fall, as we head into next winter, it's it's going to be bad. And, and hopefully, given the the collective cooperation of the scientific and clinical community, we will have made progress that maybe some of these repurposed medications or new medications will help prevent ICU admissions or, or fatalities, will help keep this, you know, like we're in a lot of ways, we're buying time until we have a vaccine, herd immunity, or some kind of intervention that prevents clinical, uh, you know, critical illness. Yeah, I mean, to, to follow up on my, you know, prediction of the darkest winter in American history, I, I will say something positive. Um, and, and it's that um, a lot of us, what we're, what we're doing now is setting up to have large trials in place. So when the case count starts to go up, we'll have patients who are trying out um, not just stuff on the shelf, but stuff that has been specifically designed for COVID-19. And so, you know, our hope is that in the fall, in the early days, we're going to actually figure out what works. Um, we're going to be able to start getting people who've been vaccinated, um, you know, data from them on these different vac vaccines that are, on the, that are out there, um, what works, what's protective. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be rough going into it. But I predict within the next year, we're going to have some solid information some evidence-based guidance for clinicians and patients on what works. So it's not all, it's not all dark. It's going to be tough. Um, but, you know, we're going we're gonna to have information. And when we have that information, and we're going to be able to take care of people. We're going to be able to reduce the number of people that require hospitalization. We're also going to reduce the number of people that don't make it back out of the hospital if they end up there. And, and one of the things that, again, is, uh, you know, this being part of the, the CAPS Center, is the, the, the social solidarity. You know, the fact that this pandemic has really pulled back the veil of people's character and we're seeing people wear masks in public, not because it's, not because I'm afraid that I'm gonna catch it from you, it's because I'm worried that I might have it and I don't wanna spread it. We're seeing people checking in on their neighbors. We're seeing people, um, you know, volunteering in food banks. It's really in a lot of ways showing the better part uh, of our nature and hopefully, um, we as a society can recognize that a lot of these social distance interventions and, and um, wearing masks, keeping your hands clean, um, actually prevent, and we flattened the curve. It came at a huge cost, economic and mental health cost, but it, it's kept our ICUs. I mean, at least here in Santa Barbara, uh, we flattened the curve and our ICU has not been as full as we were expecting. Yeah, I think what, you know, language matters, right? So I always try to replace the um, social distancing with physical distancing because I think it's important that we stay distanced physically. But I think this is a time when it's really important to use all our electronics and all our other means to stay socially connected. 
Um, I know, so Greg, can... I know you had another question as well for... Uh... Yeah, let me just jump in for a second. Um, we have just about 10 minutes left. I wish we had longer. Uh, Dr. Dan, you're aware that one of the names in the Walter Cap Center is, or one of the words is religion. And okay. unless uh, something changed lately, I know you're not a big uh, religion person yourself, though we did go through that Kierkegaard seminar together. Some I, I, I feel slightly hurt that you say that because I think of myself as a very spiritual person, but continue. <laughs> Spirituality. <laughs> I, I love that this is turning into a debate. <laughs> Someone that teaches medical humanities and is, you know, I'm, my, I'm going crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, I just wanted to make sure some of the questions have come through the chat function, and one had to do with uh, chaplains. And back to the question about physicians and mental health in hospital settings, but also with patients. Have you seen firsthand the role of chaplains? Have they been available to people? Um, how are you understanding that? Or maybe you just don't have experience with that. No, no. Um, you know, it's, we have seen um, many more um, chaplain visits, unfortunately, than, than I ever had in, you know, previous um, years of practicing medicine. Um, and so the chaplains have actually become a, really a, a part of our community in the hospital when you have so many people dying each day. Um, and I know for a lot of people that um, particularly when they can't be there with their loved ones, knowing that the chaplain was there, um, that makes a difference, right? Because um, we have a different relationship as physicians, as providers um, with regard to taking care of their loved ones. Um, but most people are, you know, whether it's religious, spiritual, there's a certain um, point where when a person dies, that becomes really important to them. And I think that that does make a difference. And we see the chaplains and they, they put on their N95 masks. They come right into basically the, the danger zones, the high risk parts of the hospital. And they're there, they're doing the last rites. They're doing all the different things that really are um, critical to a lot of people. Uh, because you know, for many of us, death is one thing, um, but dying without getting the last rites, dying without that um, religious ceremony, without these important rituals, um, that's worse. That's worse. I, you know, maybe it sounds silly, but I, my fear of dying during COVID-19 is I won't have a proper Irish wake that I will be, you know, I, I have my view, right? The proper Irish wake where they, they lay me out and people who may or may not be related are drinking Guinness and everyone's coming together. And they say the difference between an Irish funeral and a wake is one less person is drinking and that was going to be me. Um, so no, this is really, um, you do not want to die during COVID-19, but I think the chaplains have really done a tremendous job. They've really stepped up. Great. Uh, just to follow up to that, linking with the earlier theme of social justice issues and resource availability and so forth, are you seeing discrepancies in the availability of chaplains to different communities and community members? Are there gaps in who's being cared for in these most precarious um, and final moments? Or is that just beyond what your expertise? Um, so the, the hospital chaplain that I, that I see on a regular basis is um, really a multi-faith um, chaplain. So um, there are certain, um, you know, we have a very diverse population in, in the New York area. Um, so we actually have a fair number of Eastern Orthodox, um, fair number of Muslim and, and Hindu, um, but then a lot of the Christian faiths are represented as well. Right now we're during Ramadan, I guess. So um, I don't fast for the holidays, but I'm always welcome to be invited over afterwards for the sweet treats, just by the way. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, within, it's within, within your quarantine, of course, <laughs> within my quarantine, of course, from a distance, <laughs> six feet away. Um, um, but no, f fortunately, I haven't seen any inequities there. But, um, you know, that that certainly would be something that I think people should pay attention to. Yeah. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure we've just got a few more minutes. Um, Dan, maybe while uh, maybe Jason can talk a little bit, maybe you could scroll through some of the Q&A questions yourself if you're able to and just see if there's any of them. We, uh, Jason was fantastic. Thank you, Jason, in, in getting the questions to you. Um, but in case there's uh, something you want to fill out or speak more to or something we might have missed, well, I just want to make sure that the audience feels enfranchised here because this new Zoom world is not something we're all particularly adept at yet. And I, I so yearn for direct audience engagement and this doesn't do that, but I want to make sure we have a chance to uh, at least peruse some of them together. 
Yeah, I could I could run through a few um, hopefully quickly. I guess there's a question here about. Um, I think this was the early. Um, we've been predicting this coming for a long time. Are we, you know, are we going to have future pandemics? Is that going to be a regular part of our future? Um, mm -hmm. And un unfortunately, I think that you know people were talking about this for quite a while, and the way our um, global transportation and community was set up, um, it was really probably a matter of time. Um, and uh, certain pandemics, I point out that the HIV pandemic is still in full swing. Um, every year, another 50,000 people in the US are infected with HIV. Now we have this um, pretty major um, coronavirus epidemic. Um, I think that hopefully people will be aware of pandemics as something that we need to be aware of. Hopefully we can shift some of our um, national defense money to pandemic awareness and preparedness. Um, there's no reason why this pandemic should have been as disastrous as it was if we had put the resources here. Um, there were a lot of people who were calling for pan-coronavirus vaccines, pan-coronavirus therapeutics. Um, and I, I think if we- Back, back when finally, SARS and MERS was there, because SARS and yeah. MERS are, part, are in the coronavirus family. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, you could say certainly there will be more pandemics in the future, but there's no reason for it to impact us this way if we're willing to put the resources there. Um, we lost a ton of money not being prepared for this pandemic. We could have spent a minority of that amount and been prepared. As someone who, who teaches a group of pre-med students, Given that they are, 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 are studying and preparing for the MCAT to go on to medical school during the great pandemic of 2020, what, what advice do you have for them moving forward? You know, it's got to be a mixed feeling, like, right? You feel like, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm missing out. Here I am studying for my MCATs when I want to be out there doing something. So hang on to that feeling. <laughs> um, you know, unfortunately, this is still going to be here, um, you know, next fall, next winter. Um, but hopefully this will give you some sense of what you want to do in medicine. You know, infectious disease, you know, like some of the other, is one of the lowest paid specialties. And, and because of that, people have decided, well, why would I go into infectious disease when I could make much more money and get that yacht? Um, but hopefully people realize, like, this is really critical stuff. We need, we need the, the smartest, the brightest um, in infectious disease. Um, we're in short supply. And... Um, you know, hopefully this gets people even more motivated. You're going to study harder because you really want to get that spot because you want to be out here with us, helping us take care of these people. I, I'd put in a plug for emergency medicine and public health as well, <laughs> but you know, I, no. given the fact that it's currently a pandemic, I, I think, I think you're right. I think this is like the space race of our time that everyone is seeing this going, wow, you know, the, the highlight is to be able to, to be a, a renaissance man or a renaissance woman um, and, and be able to, to help their community uh, and, and, and answer the call during the, 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 the you know, during the most tur turbulent time. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think, um, Jason, you bring up a good point. Um, it takes a team with this disease. Um, and it's all the way through. It's, you know, you need people in the trenches, you need people in the ERs, um, but we really need a lot of public and global health. Um, this is important stuff. And, um, you know, if, if you basically put out the fire in your one little area, it's just going to keep coming across the borders. This needs to be a global effort if we're going to succeed. Yeah, no doubt. And Dan, if I might, um, any thoughts for classroom in the humanities, ethics, other kinds? How, how might we go about reaching our students about these issues? What, what's, what would you communicate to a classroom full of kids who are not headed into medicine, but headed into you know, the humanities? And thinking about, because I know that you have a, a great interest in the humanities. Dan was a philosophy here in college back in the day. Um, <laughs> How, think back to that person. How can you think with what's happening now to inspire some positive trajectories and, and thinking and work in humanity? I know that's a very broad question, but I'm just trying to help us think with our undergraduates. What can we do right now? Because it's very, it's hard to get traction. It's hard to feel yeah, as a, yeah. that, that anything I have to say might matter right now. How do I persuade my students that what they're doing matters right now? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think it's great that you brought that up. Um, so uh, audience probably doesn't know, but I was a philosophy major as an undergraduate. And um, Greg and I were in a Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard class together. And just this um, year, my daughter off at University um, William & Mary, College of William & Mary, was studying philosophy. So, you know, of course, this gave me an excuse to reread Descartes and, you know, some of the great philosophy, which I loved. Um, and so one of the things that we need, and I think we have a, a lack currently, i say that politely, um, is the ability to have really good critical thinking. And so I look back at those um, four or five years, I'm not sure how long I was in college, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe it was eight, but um, you know, those years really were the foundation to the critical thinking that I rely on every day. Um, and so you know, the, the humanities training that ability to think, that, that patience, that, that going through the rigor um, is so critical in every, everything you might do in your life, whether it's politics, whether it's um, you know, global health, um, whether it's all the people in the media who are trying to communicate. Um, you know, the humanities and that critical thinking and that training, I think are key. Um, and I, I sort of fall back on that when I try to figure out, I'm trying to take care of my patient, what will work, what will not work. Um, I can't just read an abstract. I can't rely on someone else. I want to have that critical thinking so that the patient looks to me and says, Dr. Griffin, what do you recommend? And it's that critical thinking that the humanities gives you that I think has really served me well. Well, thank you for, for that. That gives us uh, some courage to go forward. <laughs> um, listen, we're running out of time. I want to give you, Dan, a uh, chance to any last thoughts you want to share with us? And Jason, I want to ask you if you have it, if you could screen share at the end here, the info for your webinar that's following this on the Santa Barbara situation. I can just send it out as a chat. I'd, I'd far rather listen to Dan's uh, parting words. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to close. So thank you everyone actually for listening. And, and so sort of the, the parting words, what are the parting messages? One of the, the nice silver linings to this whole pandemic is I think it has gotten people to realize the importance of understanding the world around them. Um, a lot more people are, are interested and curious about viruses, sort of realizing um, that that's sort of a self-serving but important thing is I need to know about viruses because I live in a world full of microbes that, as we saw here, can threaten my way of life. Um, we've had a growing interest in people trying to understand the immune system and the complexities there and, and hopefully people realizing that those quick answers um, are not actually quick answers, they're, they're quick non-answers. And so um, I encourage people to listen to um, our podcasts where uh, I appreciate the crew at Microbe TV every week. Um, keep giving people the real science, um, putting it in a context. Um, you know, the recent discussion of vaccines, um, I was listening to myself and, and despite having a PhD in immunology and spending you know, half a dozen years doing virology research at Columbia, um, to listen to people really think it through, really talk it through, this is tremendous stuff. So, um, you know, during this pandemic, um, what is important? Education is important. So I, that's why I made time to, to come here. Um, because I think that the whole um, education um, foundation of our society, having educated citizens, educated individuals, is really critical for us getting through this. And this is one little spot in time. This is not going to be the only viral um, outbreak that we deal with. So educated, um, thoughtful, measured approaches are going to be critical. Um, Dan, uh, Dr. Griffin, Jason, Dr. Protetsky, we uh, thank you both so much. This was um, really, really wonderful. I wish we could have been together in person. I know we all say that, uh, but we'll try to have a chapter two in sunnier skies and better times in the future. But this was really helpful, I think, to, to many of us. So thanks, everyone, for the energy you put into this. Thank you, Dan, for staying up late to chat with us. And, oh, my pleasure. Okay. Aloha, everybody. Take care. Until next time.